100 million. That is the estimated number of people in the United States struggling with mental disorders, anxiety or CPTSD. Millions each day look for a liberating way to break free from their symptoms. The holy grail for many of them? Polyvagal theory. The science of safety. But there is one problem. Experts declare the polyvagal theory is untenable and its founder, Dr. Stephen Porch, is wrong. So are the thousands of voices of patients who were successfully treating trauma and illnesses with it. I dig my way deep into it and today you will learn what polyvagal theory is in simple words, why critics say the theory is untenable, how we can potentially can use polyvagal theory to treat trauma and mental disorders, and which polyvagal exercises thousands of patients successfully use to eliminate many of their symptoms. And let me tell you one thing up front here, I tested many of the exercises myself, and there seems to be a lot we can take away from polyvagal theory, even if there are critical voices militating against it. Welcome to today's episode, my name is Robert, I'm a highly sensitive person, and I love to provide you insight through understanding yourself. In case you have never heard of the polyvagal theory, I want to introduce you to it through a story. Imagine you're sitting in your car with your partner on a warm Saturday morning and you are on your way to the lake. You're listening to music and singing together and the mood is chill, calm and positive. You feel safe, you feel relaxed and peaceful with your partner. Suddenly an ambulance appears behind you. It drives towards you with the blue lights and loud sirens in the rearview mirror. You hadn't noticed it at all because you were so engrossed in the music and the anticipation of the lake together. Did something happen? Is there an accident ahead of you on the road? Your previously so relaxed state changes immediately. Your heart rate accelerates. Your breathing becomes shallower. Adrenaline pumps into your body. Immediately you are wide awake, gripping the steering wheel tightly. You're scared and alert. Luckily nothing happened to you. The ambulance turns into a side street and your condition calms down again. Well, on Sunday or that same weekend, your parents visit you at home. You've always had a difficult relationship with them because your father regularly shouted at you when you were a small child and your mother often lost control about her emotions. As your parents settle into your flat, you suddenly feel like you can't go back and forth. You feel like as if you are beside yourself and your field of vision narrows. You look as if through a tunnel and it feels like you are no longer with yourself and you are kind of losing yourself. You feel frozen and it's really difficult for you to be present and have an active conversation with them. So if you listen to this story now, you may have detected the three different states of the central nervous system which were explained by the polyvagal theory. I will go into that more in depth later. First of all, I want to simply explain what the polyvagal theory actually is to you. Poly refers to many and vagal refers to the very long vagal nerve which wanders through your body. In 1994, Dr. Stephen Porce introduced the polyvagal theory by himself and before that and still today many experts represent the idea that the nervous system works kind of like a switch. It's therefore on or off, so there is stress or there is no stress, there is fight or flight or there is a calm and relaxed state. In 1994, Porge came up with this hypothesis that this whole system is way more nuanced than people used to think it is. In his theory, he says that the vagus nerve, which is the largest nerve of the calm parasympathetic nervous system, plays a central role in the regulation of emotional and social states. He supposes that there must be three different states of the nervous system. The first one is the ventral vagal social engaging state. Then we have a sympathetic fight or flight state and a dorsal vagal kind of free state. When we look at evolutionary theory, those different states or parts of that nervous system developed in way different times through our existence on the planet. So the dorsal vagal part, 
which is the part which is more to the rear of your body, is the oldest part of this system and is developed around 500 million years ago, which is then 100 million years older than our sympathetic nervous system part, which we think developed around 400 million years ago. And then we have the ventral vagal part, which is the part of the nervous system which is more to the front side of your body, which developed around 200 million years ago. That one is the social, empathetic and loving system. So this ventral vagal part, which is the social, empathetic and loving system, is much younger than our primitive shutdown and freeze part, or also the sympathetic part. Now let's have a closer look at the three different states we just talked about. The short story I just told you simply describes these three states of your nervous system. The first one is the parasympathetic state, the so-called, as we heard, ventral vagal state. When we talk about this ventral vagal state, we talk about that state where you really feel grounded, where you feel in the present, where you feel connected with yourself, compassionate and really mindful. The second one is the so-called sympathetic state, the so-called, maybe you have heard about that, fight or flight state. In this state, you really feel alert, you feel ready to take action to protect yourself or to also run away. When you are in the state, you can recognize that by an accelerated heart rate. So your heart is really pumping, pump, pump, pump. Adrenaline is pumping in your body and you may experience strong feelings such as panic, such as fear or anxiety. And then there is this third one. That's the so-called dorsal vagal freeze response. This state is activated when you feel overwhelmed and you can't move. And for many of us, this especially happens during a traumatic re-experience. For example, when you have different triggers from your childhood, symptoms which appear in this state are, for example, dissociation, are numbness, are depression, helplessness, shutdown, or even a feeling of being trapped. And if you watched a previous episode about complex PTSD, you may have heard about some of these symptoms and they seem familiar to you. This is especially what happens when you have a CPTSD, that your body puts yourself into that state of freeze. This is exactly this dorsal vagal state, which is, for example, explained in this theory. Now, to better understand how we as human beings switch between those different states of our nervous system, according to this theory, we should have a close look at the main principles of the polyvagal theory. The theory itself distinguishes between three principles. The first one is that these described states are organized in a hierarchy of the autonomic nervous system. So easily spoken, it's like a picture of a ladder where these three states are categorized in. The approach of the ladder also comes from Dab Dana, who is a licensed clinical social worker and also works in Dr. Port's team. She described this model of the ladder of the polyvagal theory in her book, called the polyvagal theory in therapy. Depending on what state you're currently in, you're in a different position on the ladder. On top of the ladder, there's the calm and relaxed ventral vagal state. In the middle, there is the sympathetic state, the fight or flight state. And on the bottom of the ladder, there is this dorsal vagal freeze responsive state. The second principle of the polyvagal theory here is called neuroception. Neuroception says that the activation of the three states is also not voluntary. That is because your body scans the environment and then decides on his own, obviously, because, well, it is the autonomic nervous system, so you cannot really manually influence it. This ability called neuroception is the ability of the nervous system to detect threats and dangers in the environment by some kind of auto detection system. So like your nervous system has some kind of sensors around regarding that theory that detects any dangers in the environment and then alerts your body and puts you in the necessary state. 
And the third principle of the polyvagal theory is called co-regulation. Co-regulation is the feeling of internally being safe and also co-regulating within your relationships. Co-regulation is described as an important mechanism to connect you with other people. As human beings, we are so-called interdependent creatures and therefore we have the ability to regulate our nervous system in the contact with others. This is exactly what the polyvagal theory is all about. I think that sounds reasonable and plausible for many of us. But still, however, there are critics arguing that the polyvagal theory is untenable, especially in science. And when you read into it, the most dropped name here is Paul Grossman. Paul Grossman is also a scientist and researcher, and he argues, for example, that the only measurable phenomenon where all premises of the polyvagal theory are built on is the phenomenon of respiratory sinus arrhythmia, short form RSA. So in his opinion, the polyvagal theory has not enough of a foundation where it's built on. Other researchers such as Diana Montero also question the supposedly existent unique connection of the vagus nerve with the heart and mammals, which is a core hypothesis in polyvagal theory as well. She claims that a similar connection of the vagus nerve fiber is also found in primitive lungfish and potentially other vertebrates. There is a lot of discussion going on, especially among social neuroscientists and other researchers on the field about if the polyvagal theory is tenable. I think at this point for us as patients, as clients, as people who want answers, it's really difficult to decide whether there is a clear answer on if polyvagal theory is really completely true or if there is something you can falsify on. In case you want to find out more about the discussion about the tenability of the theory, there is a full list of criticism about the polyvagal theory collected on the website of the Polyvagal Institute called the Vagal Paradox. Dr. Porch replies to any of them and discusses them openly. So definitely check out this resource if you want to dig more into the criticism and the discussion of the polyvagal theory. To emphasize that, it truly remains open if the polyvagal theory from a scientific point of view is to be falsified in the future or not. For now, it is not completely endorsed by current social neuroscience, but definitely really popular among various clinical practitioners and patients. Last becomes especially clear when you read through hundreds of positive comments below, for example, videos on YouTube or on blog posts confirming that the theory to many of people makes a ton of sense and how it helped many people to heal from CPTSD, to better deal with autism, to finally feel safe or to treat symptoms of a highly sensitive personality or other mental illnesses and disorders. However, there are some divided voices and there are some skeptics among patients, also among health practitioners and psychologists that especially question the practical use of the polyvagal theory, especially regarding to psychotherapy. So all in all, I think the question we all still have is, is there a way to learn how to feel safe in an overwhelming environment or when you are getting triggered? And yes, that is still the autonomic nervous system we're talking about here. But is there a way to do things practically to influence this system and regulate it ourselves? So how can we use polyvagal theory? First of all, it is important to understand that even if we talk a lot about psychology here, this subject is mainly physiology. Polyvagal theory is not about changing your mindset, working on some positive belief sets or emotions here. This is about training a part of your body like a muscle. There are not just exercises within the polyvagal theory, but there is also a hypothesis that you can learn to strengthen your nervous system that has first not yet grown up, or second, 
is dysregulated, for example, by trauma. We now look in depth into a couple ways to practical approaches how we can use polyvagal theory to treat various symptoms of anxiety, illnesses, CPTSD, or other mental illnesses. The first approach we have here are so-called pendulum exercises within the polyvagal theory. So what is a pendulum exercise in the context of PVT? A pendulum exercise here means to bring yourself out of the state of relaxation into light stress and then back into that safe state. This way you train your nervous system like a muscle and at some point it will find its way back into the safe state way more quickly and way more effectively. Best you do this with another person, especially, and that's very important, in a safe environment. The one and only goal here is to become aware of the different states your nervous system might be in. So questions you can ask yourself here is, how does it feel to be in the calm and relaxed ventral vagal state? How does it feel to be in the sympathetic or in the dorsal vagal state. Can you learn to swing back from the dorsal vagal to the ventral vagal state? And how does this process of calming down actually feel like? When you do this pendulum exercises, it's extremely important and necessary to expose yourself to the trigger within safe circumstances. Let's say you're facing some kind of social anxiety or a fear of commitment because you associate relationships and social interactions with experiencing a dissociative dorsal vagal state. Then avoiding relationships and social interactions at all won't help you to break free from that dorsal vagal state. Instead, what's important is that you start seeing people or to go intentionally on dates, to go intentionally in social interactions within a safe environment, and for example, just for a couple minutes or hours in the beginning. In those interactions, you can learn to become aware of how your state might switch, even in the first minutes, if you realize that, in a social interaction that you become dissociative, that you become like freezing and like really leave your body in a way. After that, you can move back into the safe environment alone and observe again how your state swings back to a more calm and hopefully relaxed state. You should then extend the time of exposure in tiny steps. An opportunity is, of course, to work with a therapist, which can also mirror your actually behavioral patterns or how you react to a specific situation. If you struggle within social interactions, working with a therapist can especially help to learn that an interaction, for example, with the therapist itself is safe and will feel good to you. This principle of training your autonomous nervous system might be also comparable with the concept of supercompensation, which is technically an adaption to load on the nervous system. When you take the theory of supercompensation, which is by the way from sports, strength training or muscle training, then you can build up more ability to strength to get back to the safe state quicker and more efficient, like walking up a stairway. This model works like that. You walk two stairs up, fall one stair down, then again, walk two stairs up, but you're starting not from zero, but from level one, then one down again, then you're at level two. Then you can walk two up, you're at four, fall one down, you're at three, two up, you're at five, one down, you're at four, and so on and so on. This way you can learn how to strengthen your system, in this case your nervous system, to build up more resilience and also more strength to deal better within social interaction if you're struggling with that, for example. Then related to the polyvagal theory, we also have so-called eye movement desensitization and reprocessing exercises, short form is EMDR. EMDR itself is also a therapeutical approach you should definitely look into that if you're curious about that one. 
So eye movement, which is part of the eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy, suppresses the activation of the amygdala, imitates walking and therefore mimics a sense of walking, which is a flight reaction to the nervous system in the brain, which then re-regulates your nervous system back. So again, simplified, you are imitating some kind of sympathetic response to a threat. So in this case, you're moving your eyes like you would walk, for example, if you would run away from a threat or from a tiger, from something dangerous, which then activates your nervous system and brings you back to the social state because you actually use this activation because you actually run away and use this fight or flight response. And you actually came after that fight or flight response. I think for the same reason, reading also might calm us down. Comments on YouTube say that exercises like this, for example, are really great for calming your nervous system down by imitating this flight response. So in case you want to try this kind of exercise or this therapeutical approach, there are a ton of self-administrated exercises on YouTube, such as this one. When you do such an exercise, again, I'm not a therapist, I'm just a client, I'm a patient, but what I found is really helpful if you approach this exercise with three steps before you do this exercise. So first of all, imagine your traumatic and triggering memory first what beliefs come up within that imagination. For example, sentences like, I have to be alert, I have to pay attention, or I'm worthless, something like that. Then secondly, allow yourself to relax back in a safe environment. It's important that you do this exercise in a safe environment and relax back into the here and now. And then third, imagine the new and safe environment and beliefs this new feelings of safety, which then replace your difficult beliefs and your difficult sensations. So you can tell yourself sentences like, look, I'm in that safe environment here, so I'm safe now, especially during this exercise. Then start this eye movement exercise. I tried the exercises myself a couple times, and for me, I think it was not that mind-blowing as people say, but maybe it's different for you as well. What I still found out was that while doing the MDR exercise, the body tends to not dissociate, especially when I try to think about a trigger. And it seems that the ventral vagal state definitely snaps back in way quicker. Also, one day after doing this exercise, I could escape a trigger situation more quickly, but I don't know if it's really because of this EMDR exercise or just because of my last therapy session I just had, because I'm currently also doing another type of therapy, not EMDR. We go on with another mechanism we can learn from the polyvagal theory, which is maybe a good approach to feel better and to better deal with trigger situations. And I brought this up before, it's called the co-regulation. So regarding the polyvagal theory, co-regulation is a mechanism we mammals do. In co-regulation, our nervous system is regulated within relationships with others in a positive and negative way. And maybe you know this, when you are in a really good mood, then it seems like this good mood is spreading like a virus within a friend group. You can really give this good mood to another person. Same is, for example, when you are in a neutral mode and your partner is in a really bad mood. Say your partner had a really bad day and you really sense that your nervous system tries to go in sync with your partner's nervous system and attracts this kind of mood, which then influences you as well. As children, we learn to re-regulate ourselves from our parents. In the case that your parents also have unsolved trauma inside, they may pass it over to you because especially the child can't really regulate its nervous system on its own. So what you learn as a child that regulating is really difficult 
or it doesn't work at all or is even traumatic because your parent passed its trauma directly into your brain in that scenario. When in a dysregulated, for example, free state, co-regulating with a calm other person or creature like a dog as well, is a really helpful way to get back into a more calm and more relaxed ventral vagal state. So cuddling, hugging, holding are especially helpful. For me, for example, co-regulation is really helpful, especially just the feeling of being held when I feel really overwhelmed. Also co-regulating with a dog or other pets to me seemed quite helpful. And that's because the physical contact with an animal releases oxytocin, which has a calming effect on the body. I also looked for specific vagus nerve exercises, which therefore you can do, especially in triggered states or when you're overwhelmed, when you're in the free states, to activate your ventral vagal system and therefore create again a feeling of safety and calm you down. There is a YouTuber, Suki Baxter, who explains three exercises in this video. All you're going to do is simply bring your right hand to the top of your head and tip your right ear towards your right shoulder. So you're going to be side bent to the right. And then what you're going to do is just shift your eyes only, so your head's going to stay in this position, and your eyes only are going to go up and towards the left. So they're going to move towards the left side of your vision. And we're just going to hold this for 30 seconds. Personally, I found them really to be relaxing. For me, they especially removed tension in my neck and in my face because stress to me often causes tension in my jaw muscles so i can definitely recommend doing and trying these exercises also definitely repeating them for a couple days might even give you better results then last exercise also activating the polyvagal system is called an ear massage. There is another tutorial by Suki Baxter on her YouTube channel. And what she offers you on her channel is this kind of ear massage where you can really remove tension in your head muscle and therefore also activate the polyvagal system. So the first place that we're going to access your vagus nerve in your ear is in the little hollow that is above the ridge that is just above your ear canal. So go ahead and find the little hollow. So you're gonna to come towards the ear canal. There's the little ridge above it. And then just gently slide your finger into the hollow that is above that ridge. And what we're gonna do is just make gentle circles there. You can also go back and forth if that's a little easier, but we're just gently massaging this little area here. And really you want to think about moving the skin of your ear in little circles. You're not pressing really hard, grinding away on it. You don't actually need much pressure at all. We're just sliding the skin around in circles. And as you're doing this, you may notice some physiological changes or you might not. So things you may notice might be changes in your breathing, maybe a sigh or a swallow. You might just feel a sense of calm. And if you don't, that's okay too. My current therapist also said that, especially children, if you observe them, they do massages and touch their ears to calm themselves down pretty intuitively. But as we grow up, we stop doing that because we think it's kind of weird. So maybe we all did this before, but we stop because we think we're too awkward when we do that. I think it's still quite reasonable. So that might be definitely helpful to try out in a place where you do not feel that observed to massage your ears. I tried it out as well. To me, there was not a really big effect, but still I found it to be relaxing and it's definitely some kind of calming sensation which is activated within your head. Now to sum up the polyvagal theory, can we learn to feel safe? We can through doing exercises which calm us down through exposing ourselves to triggers and tiny steps and through working with a therapist. What we can't do is finding a clear answer whether polyvagal theory is tenable or not. 
Critics might still argue that the principles of the polyvagal theory are not based on enough real-world data. So at this point, polyvagal theory is what it seems, a theory which is whether proving right or wrong. But for us patients, does that really matter? Isn't it probably more useful to extract the things that might give us a scythe of relief from symptoms and therefore make us feel better and more safe here? In the end, many exercises from the polyvagal theory in combination with other therapeutical approaches work really well for thousands of people, maybe also for you. So what do you think about the polyvagal theory? Definitely let me know in the comments, especially if you tried out different approaches from the theory or different exercises yourself. Have you done them for a couple days? Have you done them for a couple weeks, months, or even years? And did they make you feel better? Because I think that is the interesting part. Can we learn to feel safety by doing, for example, exercises? Definitely let me know. Also subscribe to the podcast here on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, wherever you listen. And I see and speak to you in the next episode.